It really is my pleasure today to be talking about this uh, this very interesting field. At least, at least that's uh, that's what many are thinking nowadays about learning and differential equations. So. To preface this, I'd like to say that uh, learning, machine learning and differential equations have a very long history together um, in many aspects, uh, modeling, optimization. Today, we're gonna to be taking a specific perspective, a, a very new perspective indeed. And that's what is being called continuous depth uh, learning for a specific reason that we'll see, but was already uh, introduced before. So the schedule for today um, is as follows. Um, will be a multi a multi step uh, kind of presentation. Um, I will give you a little bit of background on what continuous depth uh, learning uh, means, what the objectives are, uh, and why we should care as a community. Um, a lot of a lot of this content will be relying on will be focused on neural uh, ordinary differential equations, which are not everything; uh, they're a core component of the field. And they're a good uh, instructive first step into the field since it's a very clean, um, very simple way to um, say a way without too many assumptions to merge uh, differential equations and uh, neural networks. In particular, uh, merging a very specific type of differential equation, which is arguably uh, the, the simplest one, the most well behaved ones, uh, the ordinary differential equation. We'll then take a look at some of the more recent uh, works, including. Um, some of, of our papers, um, going beyond all these, maybe to other classes of differential equations. All this would be taking around uh, 35 to 40 minutes, um, hopefully. And then we'll look at uh, Torstein, a library that, I'm, uh, that I co-developed with uh, some collaborators, all dedicated to neural differential equations and continuous step learning. Uh, we'll show you what is, uh, what, what is possible in around 10 minutes and how you can change some of the templates for your own applications and then we'll finish with uh, with the q a so i'd like to say that um, you won't see aside from the code the live uh, code walkthrough you won't see as many discussions of results and applications i'm trying to give you as broad an overview as possible with enough technical content that with the help of torch uh, dying tutorials as well as uh, one or two references you'll be able to then uh, go on your own uh, really focus on the specific applications that you care about, be it finance, control, or what have you. Okay, so continuous step framework. Um, we are somewhere around the intersection between many fields, uh, deep learning, machine learning, dynamical systems, and vast differential equations. Um, what is the uh, what is the object, the final objective? Um, we'd like to have the same type of types of successes that we've had in other traditional machine learning fields, such as computer vision and uh, natural language processing, um, but that haven't had the same type of widespread use yet. So something like physics, uh, the, the broader sciences, medicine, finance, that have been, you know, where, where some of the, the other methods, classical methods have been applied, but they haven't yet uh, reached um, mainstream usage or deployment. To do this, we need to go beyond uh, what we what we know uh, deep learning models to be, and some of the people in this field often refer to this uh, symbiotic relationship between deep learning and dynamical systems. Indeed, indeed some people are working on on one direction. Uh, they're working on uh, injecting more deep learning and machine learning into methods to help dynamical system uh, research. Um, differential equation research, scientific machine learning, stuff like improving um, numerical methods with um, neural networks, for example. Some other people are working on the other direction, um, importing some of the, the mathematical tools and knowledge which have been developed for the, the past two centuries, almost or longer, uh, dynamical systems, optimal control to help in more traditional um, machine learning tasks. So to start, um, let's dive a little bit uh, more into the details. And let's see how we can justify the formulation of neural D, what the object is, and how we can get there. So there's there's several ways to get to the neural D formulation. We'll take the, say, the original path uh, of the seminal paper that uh, I'm sure many of you have, have heard of by Chen et al. The one best paper uh, was one of the four best papers at uh, New Reap 2018. 
Uh, and the argument goes as follows. So let's say, uh, let's suppose to have a discrete dynamical system of this type, which is indeed uh, a residual network. So the layer to layer dynamics of a residual network, where you have the, the so-called skip connection, where you pass through a parameterized nonlinear function, your residual block, and then you add it back to your input. Now, if you squint at this, um, you introduce a sort of a phantom term here that has been simplified away, equal to one. Uh, if you squint at this and rearrange some of the terms, you see that it uh, looks like a forward Euler discretization. For those of you that uh, have a little bit of a background in numerical methods or you remember calculus, uh, it's sort of the definition of a forward derivative, right? Um, but we're missing the limit here. So it's sort of an, a rough approximation, very rough approximation of the derivative uh, in S. Now, if you take this, this quantity here, you put it here, um, we're almost, almost there in the sense that we need to make some, some considerations. First off, S here, um, I'm using S for a very specific reason. Uh, more traditional, you, you would use something like K uh, to index, uh, a, a K integer to, to index your, your, your layer, layer one, layer two, layer, layer three. Now here, S becomes a continuous, uh, a real uh, scalar value. And that's why it's called continuous step uh, learning. So you're still uh, sort of indexing your layers, but you're doing it uh, an infinite amount of times uh, potentially. So that's the first difference. Second, uh, second thing that's missing is uh, an interface with the data. So I'm trying to do, to do learning, trying to achieve some task, to, to solve some task. So we need an interface with their external data. And the data for neural ODs is nothing more than the initial condition of this whole thing, which is nothing more than uh, an initial value problem. So it's a problem that needs to be solved. And this is where the numerical methods come in, right? Um, if you add some more bells and whistles, this is the generalized formulation that you see in, uh, in our, um, or our paper at uh, NeurIPS. You may see some other um, things that help relieve some of the limitations that we'll briefly see later. Uh, something uh, that's very useful, for example, is having parameters uh, varying in depth. Um, now, this is where having the, um, the S depth variable as a real really comes into play, right? Even in your uh, residual networks, you could think of the, the parameter tensors for each residual block as being a function, taking the layer index and spitting out your, your parameter tensor. You could think of it this way. And indeed, you can think of this, um, let me open the chat, the other one. You can think of it uh, here, even here in the same, in the same uh, way. Um, uh, indeed here you have a complication in that you have, uh, you would have infinitely many layers. And, and so if you have uh, non-constant parameters, that's a problem that we'll see how to, to tackle. Something else you, can, you could have is a variable amount of depth, a variable amount of layers in some sense. So a learnable integration bound for the initial value problem. You could have some embedding, encoding, and decoding steps to go from your data space to your uh, space where F lives. And yeah, you can have some additional conditioning uh, on the vector field. So the point here is F. F is everything. F is where your D um, interfaces with uh, neural networks. F is often a neural network parameterized by theta. It doesn't have to be a neural network. It can be anything, uh, Gaussian process that has been done even non-parametric non, uh, um, function approximators it can really be anything. Uh, the point here is that um, by taking this view, we're, um, we're transforming learning into um, a different type of problem. So of learning the map directly that uh, shapes the data in some way, that morphs the data in some way. We're learning an underlying vector field that lives in, in some space. And I'll give you some more intuition later on. This is a good point to, to stop and really develop an intuition, uh, which will then help uh, pretty much everywhere in this field. So the solution of an IVP uh, simply takes this, this form. Um, you have your input data, you map it to your initial condition, for example, here. Now the problem is, is indeed here, uh, solving uh, for the integral of the vector in the vector field, which will draw this, uh, this uh, squiggly line. Then taking the final point here, you, you can map it back with another uh, neural network and you have your solution of the, of the IVP. Now, um, this is I think another very useful um, uh, thing to look at. So 
what we are learn learning is a vector field that is a vector valued function which takes so we're, we're living in some space of fixed dimension we can change our dimension um, so there's no uh, you know and then linear uh, going from 10 to 15 to 10 to 4 across the neural d has to be fixed sort of like a residual uh, network um, the vector field uh, has to be shaped so the vector field is parameterized you see it evolves both across training iterations as well as um, for depth varying parameters also varies across integration and it's it, it, it will learn to be shaped to pull data in certain ways that help uh, for the task at hand in this case you're looking at the binary classification problem we're trying to separate inner and outer circle and you see that the, ve the vector field pulls the the inner points uh, apart even learns to to flip it to flip some of the the, the, the vector field uh, vectors to 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 better help downstream layers achieve their task so this is um, all the intuition that's really required to, to understand what is different about neural uh, i'd like to say that there's uh, like i mentioned before there's a long history uh, between differential equations and machine learning um, even the idea of neural itself um, some some would say um, the idea was in the air already indeed if you check some of the work by a mathematician way and e and some others you see that you find um, some of these formalizations available as well as the idea of normalizing flow continuous normalizing flow as a link to optimal transport for those of you that uh, are familiar with uh, normalizing flows and there's also an, an even older line of work on continuous time so the concept of depth and time is interesting to to keep in mind there's a difference the, the reason why uh, we use depth is that for example in a classification task we are, we are fixed in time there's no time evolving uh, depth takes more of a, a space connotation so evolving through uh, the depth, the space of the network. You can view time if you have a time series, like an RNN, then you can have the, the data time as, as time, the data dimension as time. Or uh, in some other um, references, you see the training iterations as time. So the vector field evolves in time, but solving on the vector field uh, would be a propagation through depth of the network. Okay. So why should we, why should we bother with this? Uh, there's many ways, uh, there's many aspects, uh, many reasons for this. I'm going to be giving you some. Um, uh, maybe some, some others will come up in the Q&A. So we'll start with, um, say, the, the reason that um, uh, many think uh, was behind uh, the neural D paper getting really popular was this idea of having a constant memory gradients, parameter gradients, to, to optimize in standard deep learning fashion and constant in depth. So in number of layers on so in integration depth, we don't have any, any overhead. Um, you have advantages in learning and control. It's a good uh, prior knowledge to, to insert. If you know you're, you're controlling a robot, uh, you know you want to use an OD, you even know a specific form of OD you might want to use. You might want to use an Euler Lagrange formulation. You might want to use a second order system if it's mechanical, et cetera. Similarly for forecasting, if you want to do uh, stock price forecasting, you might want to use a neural SD, you might have some prior knowledge on, 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 on uh, all kinds of parameters that you can, you can include. You can do cheap density estimation, you can do other, other things. Now there's also disadvantages that are important to keep in mind. So neural ODs are less expressive, unless you, you're careful about how you, you design your model, than equivalent or analog uh, discrete models. They have more computer requirements because it's no longer about only about the model, but it's about the model and the solver. We'll see this later with the hyper solver idea. Uh, it's new, so there's, uh, there's different techniques and mathematical um, tools to develop, um, to use in order to, to, to fully understand and implement, even implement on a practical level, these models and, and thus it's less accessible. Although I, I hope uh, that the talk today will be uh, a small remedy for the last the last disadvantage so we start with the perhaps this is the most uh, technically involved section i don't expect all of you to understand all the details unless you have prior uh, background on either optimal control or um, really excellent background on, on ODs. Um, i'm going to be giving you a proof sketch and some of the, the intuitions hopefully uh, at least you have an idea 
of uh, how training is performed for um, these models. So um, let's suppose to have a, a loss function of this type that has two terms, a terminal a loss term, or for those of you from control, a terminal cost. Um, we assume to have um, maybe some downstream layers, right? So this is the solution of the OD, we assume to have of the neural OD. So now if you, if, you, if you look at this, this is, and if you're also familiar with optimal control, this is um, the, the type of loss that you see in control. And if you want to minimize this, um, what you're uh, ending up with is um, an optimal control problem um, of this type, right? So the, the problem now, I say the, the DOD itself becomes a constraint um, of, of the problem, trying to minimize this across a mini batch of, of size K, where K uh, indexes the, the, the samples in the, of data. And then we have our other con um, conditions, our other boundary uh, constraints right here. So how do we solve this? In some situations, we can indeed solve this analytically, but we need some assumptions on, on, on F the dynamics on the constraint. And in this case, where the vector field itself is, is a, a neural network, a really complicated function, it's, it's impossible to find an analytic solution, which means we're going to approximate a solution, uh, a, as good a solution as we can find. So it will be a non-globally optimum solution with a gradient descent, an iterative procedure and the parameters. So our task is finding these uh, gradients with respect to the parameters as with uh, any other learning task. We have two options, two uh, umbrella options. One is by propagating through the discretization of, of, uh, of the OD, the solution of the initial value problem, which would be doable, right? No, no problem. We will choose a numerical solver like the, the Euler scheme that we saw before, which approximates this continuous solution with a limited number of steps. Uh, this is what you will um, often do in, in implementation, but it's not the actual gradient uh, with respect through the solution of, of the OD. The second option is you have to find a, a way to, to do this uh, in closed form analytically for the gradients uh, with respect to, to theta or the loss with respect to theta. And the problem of using uh, your traditional chain rule is this integral right here that poses problems. So here comes the, uh, the joint method comes to the rescue and um, so the way it works is the, so the intuition is uh, we introduce an additional uh, set of variables, a co-state, uh, a vector of Lagrangian multipliers. So we're applying some ideas from the calculus of uh, variations. And we're, we're solving another OD, right? We're solving a final value problem because we have a boundary condition at the end of the network, the final depth. And we are uh, only get backward in such a way so that the A's will be defined in such a way that we have a specific relationship that defines our, our gradients. In particular, this is what uh, it looks like. So for, uh, for the simplest case where parameters are fixed in depth, um, you have your optimal control problem. Uh, this is your final value problem. A is your vector, your co-state vector, your vector of Lagrangian multipliers, depending on uh, what your um, say perspective is on this type of, of approach. Uh, this is what it is. And you, you're essentially saying if my A starts, so the initial, the final value, but the initial value for the backward to D is the gradient of this terminal loss with respect to, to the solution. And it evolves according to this uh, relationship here. Then I have this, um, I have this closed form um, expression for the gradients. So the proof sketch now, um, fully diving deep into, into this uh, will require another uh, 20, 30 minutes. Um, I will give you a proof sketch to, give, to get, get you uh, thinking about, uh, maybe you have some other perspectives that you can connect to this, some other uh, proofs, some other ideas that you've seen. Uh, if you're really serious into um, doing research in, in this field, or you're just interested you know, in getting uh, your hands dirty, I suggest uh, walking through this proof uh, yourself. It's maybe 10 lines, so mostly rearranging terms. Um, we have a, a good reference, I think, in our, um, uh, a new EPS paper in the appendix, very compact uh, proof. And the proof goes as follows. Um, it's a few steps, conceptual steps. First, you introduce uh, Lagrangian multipliers. So um, you, you have to introduce a perturbed uh, version of the loss right, in, in, in this way. As in traditional uh, calculus of variation, 
your Lagrangian multipliers will be weighting uh, your um, uh, the the the, um, the amount uh, that you are uh, not respecting your your um, uh, condition, your constraint. Uh, this is the if you put an equal here, you recall this is the dynamics constraint of the optimal control problem. Uh, L is your total loss, so you're introducing a perturbed version of L. Uh, then you're computing the, the derivative of L with respect to the parameters as a function of A, right? You, you flip this to the left side and then you, you'll do some a uh, uh, little bit of uh, integration by parts and there's a couple of steps. Um, you, get a, you get a function of A of this um, Lagrangian multiplier vector. And then you pause it, you say, if A satisfies the final, final value problem that we saw before, then you can simplify a lot of terms away and you get this. this uh, so what, what you calculated in the second step simplifies in several ways and you get this, this uh, form here, which is easy to compute, easy enough to compute in, uh, in your uh, preferred deep learning frameworks. So this is the exact gradients. What do we do? We don't need to store anything uh, for this. What do we do in case uh, the parameters are uh, a function of S itself, so they're not, they're not constants. Well, in that case, uh, you need to go a little bit uh, beyond what you saw before. This is one of, um, also in the appendix of uh, one of our uh, new IPS papers. Um, you need to make some assumptions to simplify the proof at a couple of key points in that the function theta of S uh, needs to belong to, uh, needs to be an a square integrable, integrable fun function that comes into play uh, we are simplifying with the Dirac delta if you're interested in the details. But you see that this is exactly the same. You just change here, you have a derivative in um, function space, so called Gatto derivative in function space, which is uh, impossible or very difficult to compute, I should say. So you need to introduce another uh, discretization, another approximation of the problem to compute this, to actually compute this and implement this. Um, there's two ways, um, two main ways to do this. You can discretize in depth. So in, in S, uh, that means you have parameters that are a piecewise constant. And in that, in that case, we saw before, you have just many of the same problem uh, we saw before. So you know exactly how to uh, compute the gradients. Or you can discretize in function space, uh, meaning uh, you don't consider all uh, square integrable functions. You, you choose a subset of them that can be expressed as a linear combination, the alpha j's of some uh, eigenfunctions. You choose an eigenbasis of functions. That's that's uh, could be Fourier harmonics, could be could be uh, polynomials, Chebyshev polynomials, and then you 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 turn this into the learning of these alphas that combine your your uh, eigenfunctions. And this is what it looks like for a binary classification problem. You have a piecewise uh, constant parameter, so you might have a polynomial discretization. So again, this doesn't look discrete. It's discrete in the space of functions. So it's less expressing the space of functions, but it's, it's continuous in, in, uh, in depth right here. And if you, if you use vanilla neural these, you could have uh, constant functions here. Okay. So um, let's move along a little bit, um, I think, to here. Um, so there's a lot more to say about neural Ds. Um, um, it's arguably one of the hottest uh, subfields now in, in deep learning, at least in some key conferences, and for good reason. Like there's um, many applications are uh, pretty much every week. There's a new paper exploring a new application, and uh, uh, you know it's it's an attractive way to to impose your prior knowledge of of a model. Uh, why should we do reinforcement learning with uh, RNN? Uh, surrogate models when we can we know we know we're controlling a, a pendulum for example we know exactly what shape the ODE has even if we don't know every parameter we know more or less you know we might know it's conservative we might know so it's in that sense it's good what are the, the downsides the downsides it's it, it, there's many that's what we saw before the greatest one that's currently um, slowing the field down is the fact that these are slow uh, slow for inference and um for training, um, the problem is, is related to, to the inference speed. Uh, in terms of training iterations, uh, they're often better than uh, corresponding analog discrete models. It's just that to do one uh, inference pass, it takes longer. Since you need to choose a solver, you need to choose a correct solver. Uh, you need to ensure that the solution is close enough and um, can be difficult. So 
something that people um, have started thinking about is regularization techniques for the vector field. And it's a, it's a strange regularization uh, perspective in that we're trying to make the vector field easier to solve for usually adaptive step solvers. So we're trying to make the vector field less nonlinear, less, um, let's say, um, um, more well behaved so that it's easier to solve. But that in some, in some perspective, it's also making, uh, putting some constraints on the expressivity of the model. So similar to, you know, uh, your uh, L2, L1 regularization, uh, but more, more in, indirect perhaps. Now, what the problem is with, uh, with these approaches is that you can't always regularize the, the vector field. So if you're doing control and you have a partial model of your uh, robotic arm, uh, there's nothing you can do to regularize the dynamics of your, uh, of, your, of your robot, you know, they're, they're what they are and often ugly. Um, so this is not the answer uh, going forward. Probably won't be the answer for all applications. It, it's pretty good for uh, purely machine learning applications where you don't have any, any, any other uh, prior uh, component of the OD or the ST or what have you. So what we would like then is to explore the connection with solvers, like instead of, of um, taking solvers as another black box component, we're just importing into, into our, our field. We want to, to look at them as, as design um, components as well. So how to make this interplay better, how to understand it better. So very quick primer, because we don't have a lot of time on uh, OD solvers, explicit OD solvers. So we saw the Euler um, forward method. Um, you're just iterating uh, through the integral to, to approximate it as well as you can, right? So you're choosing some points on your, on your continuous solution. Um, your design choices are your, your step size, uh, your map fee, so for Euler, um, uh, Psi, I should say. Um, for Euler, it's simply the vector field evaluated at that, at that point. For other solvers, such as uh, Runge-Kutta methods, which are really popular, um, it's a combination of um, various things. Uh, the, the quickest way, the most complete way you can characterize a method is by the uh, butcher tableau coefficients. These are coefficients that are collected in a certain way, displayed in a certain way. There's a matrix A and there's two uh, vector of coefficients. And these tell you how you, you, you uh, combine certain uh, stage evaluations of the solver. Um, they're found in, in uh, very specific ways. So the field of numerical analysis is often, uh, uh, this is what, what a lot of it is, trying to improve, uh, trying to find better coefficients by solving different optimization problems or putting different constraints on the type of solver you want, you want to get better um, coefficients. And different solvers uh, have different properties, of course. Uh, this is only a very small fraction. There's multi-step multi solver, there's uh, um, predictor corrector schemes, adaptive step, uh, implicit, et cetera. But this, is, this, is, uh, this will do for the, the discussion. So the hyper solver idea, what we would like to, to uh, shine light on is the fact that you can discretize in your OD. Uh, you, you need to discretize in your OD to solve, solve it. Um, we'd like to have a, a faster neural OD in that um, the number of discretization steps for an accurate solution uh, needs to be minimized. So how should we, how should we do this? A, a way is uh, to take the solver, a P, uh, P order solver, which means we're doing P uh, roughly speaking, there's some technicalities involved. You're doing P evaluations of the vector field. So if, if the vector field is a 10 layer neural network, you want to minimize that uh, as much as possible. For one step of, of your approximation, your discretization, you're doing many uh, evaluations, many forward passes of, of the, the vector field, the neural network. So you want to take a base solver, P order, and you want to make it better by introducing a, a learning component, an hyper solver network. So we call hyper solver this whole uh, combination. The upper solver is trained on, on local truncation residuals. So you're, you're, you're looking at your uh, discretization of the base solver. And then at each point, you're comparing the step that will be taken by the solver and one taken by a really accurate solver or the actual ground truth solution if you have it available. If you do this, um, so you, you solve this, this um, supervised learning problem or G um, and you have this, um, uh, better bound on the local truncation error, which is better than um, your, your uh, um, this is the step size, by the way. You would have an epsilon to the p for the p-th order solver, and instead you have a delta 
epsilon to the p plus one where delta if delta is the say the approximation capability like your hypersolver network uh, if you train it correctly will be an epsilon will be a delta approximator where delta is, is hopefully much smaller than one so you have a better um a better uh, bound here um this is um, a good reference if you'd like to, to have a clearer picture of how you can do this with neural these and um, you compare this with uh, other solvers even higher order solvers so say we have a, a hyper euler variant so it's a it's a first order method with um, a learning uh, component to approximate second order residuals you are more competitive than your your base solver but also higher order methods and here you're looking at First row, you're looking at MNIST results for a neural OD image classification, cipher 10. You're looking at uh, solution error, average percentage error on the so actual solution. You don't care about, uh, about the task. And here you're looking at um, test classification accuracy, right? So you're training with a, an adaptive step solver that's really accurate. And then you're, you're, you're evaluating how much you're losing by then speeding up for, for inference later on, like deployment or, or, or your, your needs later on once it's trained so i like to stress that this is once it, it's uh, trained we're looking at how you you could use this also for uh, for a training so there's more uh, technicalities involved but you like to have a discretization that preserves as much as possible of solution accuracy and uh, task accuracy something also interesting um I quickly mention is that you can um, generalize across base solvers without uh, fine-tuning so you if you if you consider a second order runge kutta second order uh, family of solver, explicit solvers. Uh, turns out there is, a, there is such a thing as a parameterized um, family of solvers. So you can tune this uh, scalar value to get potentially an infinite number of solvers. If you, if you train your upper solver uh, with alpha 0 0.5 as its, its, its base solver, and then you evaluate with alpha fine tuning against the, the equivalent solver, you, you see that uh, um, it doesn't really need uh, any fine tuning to preserve um, the same Pareto efficiency. Uh, there's more to say that there's more results. Um, we, we hope um, this is just the beginning, but something that's really exciting is that um, we see this as, um, as uh, a link or as a, as a similar um, way in which NLP models, natural language processing models have been um, uh, successfully pre-trained on large corpuses of data for better performance. We see this as, as something similar for neural ODs in that you, you, you might have a, a general hypersolver that's pre-trained on a large corpus of dynamics of fixed dimension, for example. And then you, you can use this to train and, and infer neural ODs, neural STs, so sort of a pre-trained uh, large numerical methods. Not too large though, because there's, uh, um, there's an overhead. All right. so. Very quickly, some uh, something to whet your appetite if you, if you want to go beyond neural Ds. You don't think neural Ds are interesting. I know many of you are uh, into finance. Uh, I also had a little bit of experience in finance. And this is one of the questions we get the most. Um, are neural SDs used uh, in finance? Uh, can you ex expand your support in neural SDs? So neural SDs, you can already play with them in uh, Torstein, our library. And pretty much everything I've said so far applies to them as well in terms of training. The adjoint training holds um, holds for them as well. Uh, pretty much the same the same formulation. Um, we have um, uh, this is a very active field of research, and we expect uh, a fairly large impact on finance as more uh, experts in, in domain experts will, uh, will uh, you know, start um, exploring with uh, with these. Mm, graphs so data as graphs is uh, pretty much ubiquitous you can um, you can have neural ds on graphs it's called neural gds um, where you have now a vector field that's on a graph so you can use your graph neural network layers as the, the underlying vector field um, where you can evolve for example your your node uh, feature matrix z uh, if you if you have a, a sequence of graphs you might want to have something like an rnn like a mix of an RNN and, and the neural OD, where you evolve your node features in between observation times, and then you incorporate with an RNN cell, the equivalent of a graph RNN cell, you incorporate your graph information into a latent space, and then you flow from then on. 
this is also a new a new field of research that has already attempts with um, uh, stochastic uh, so neural graph stochastic differential equations. Um, if you want a true continuous version of RNNs, um, you can have a full solve. So if your your data is not a, just an initial condition, but it's a time series, for example, and you don't want to have an hybrid between uh, like an RNN cell and an STM cell and a neural D in between. Uh, if you want to solve everything with one um, OD solve, for example, you can look at control differential equations uh, where you can, for example, interpolate your data and you can, you can condition uh, the, the vector field on, on this interpolation. You have different values here affecting the vector field. Uh, this roughly, the, the theory of uh, control differential equations and also rough differential equations, if you're familiar, that extends to the stochastic case is um, really fantastic as um, it's a way to, to tie your intuitions uh, together uh, once you start playing with uh, these objects. So where you have, um, you know, you, you have, a, a, you would have an integration on, on time or depth, but you also have other driving signals. So for an ST, you, you'd have your Brownian motion, but here you can have other objects like an interpolation of data, but you might have a, a also an, a stochastic driving signal that's nothing like a, a Brownian motion. Uh, really opens up your, your uh, creativity. Okay, so I think we're um, reaching the end. So we'll look, um, I think I'll be really quick with the code, um, but I'd be happy to to um, answer on Slack. So we have a really active, uh, sort of active Slack, but I really uh, encourage you to join. Uh, we have around 40 people right now. A lot of researchers in, in this uh, space that you might uh, know are uh, present. If you have any implementation problems or any ideas, uh, feel free to join. So this is what some of the code we'll see now looks like. These are some of the other ideas um, um, that are still work in progress. Uh, there's a lot more, it's really opening up. And I expect a bigger and bigger percentage of AI conferences next year to be about uh, continuous depth learning. This is our open research group. So again, um, feel free to contact me uh, anywhere, but also on, on Slack. Um, these are again some, some references. Uh, I maintain a repo with a lot of the um, latest papers on your ODs and your differential equations. Uh, this is our link to Torstein. Um, maybe I'll share the slides later and uh, our hosts can, uh, or I can uh, share some of these links uh, later on. All right. So now one moment, uh, we'll take a look at the code and then we'll do some Q&A. Okay, yeah, this is the fun part. I know for many of you, I hope we can do it justice. Okay, so I'll, I'll be I'll be brief because I really I really want to hear your questions and uh, talk to you about this. Um, okay, so there won't be any live coding because we don't have time. I want to show you uh, a few things you can do. So we talked about neural these uh, for a while. Uh, let's see how uh, how it's like to to train one on a binary classification task. Uh, this is just a training loop. Um, we're using PyTorch Lightning, which I, I greatly um, recommend. So it will reduce your boilerplate. Uh, but this is just a training loop. Um, so again, I'm assuming you're familiar with uh, PyTorch or at least TensorFlow um, to follow. Uh, otherwise, it, it's going to be confusing for five minutes. I apologize. Okay, let's say we have a vector field um, that's just a very simple, um, just a very simple um, NLP of this type, right? Very shallow. Um, you can define a neural D or a neural D object. Uh, they're both okay as follows. You have a bunch of uh, options to, to uh, choose. This is one of the core classes of Thorstein, but we have one for SDs as well, which we'll see later, and there's gonna be more. So what you, what you do then, you can choose between a joint and an autoguard to backpropagate through, and you can, uh, you can simply uh, train, right? So there's nothing, uh, there's nothing mystifying about this. I want to show you how the flows look, and then I also want to show you um, the difference if we use a depth varying uh, version, both in uh, uh, convergence as well as uh, the actual flows. Okay. So with a neural D object, you can um, uh, construct the flow at a certain um, uh, set of points, right? 
So a, a, a span is simply a collection of points in depth where you want to evaluate your, your flow. And this is what the two dimensions look. This is a two dimensional uh, classification problem. And this is what it looks like in the state space. So the two dimensions against each other, right? So this is the initial condition. We are trying to uh, pull them apart as you saw before. Now, what if you want to use um, depth varying parameters? Well, it's really simple here. Uh, we have a variety of um, uh, eigen, eigen basis you can choose, Chebyshev polynomials, uh, RDF, uh, radial basis functions, etc. Looks exactly the same. Uh, this is also a very useful uh, trick um, where you you can include a dependency on the depth variable itself, an explicit dependency. And what this will do, it will concatenate along uh, this dimension here. So this is uh, NMLP, so we'll just be using linear layers with the first dimension being at batch size. We'll be concatenating S along the, the first dimension to, to uh, feed it into uh, the layers below. So if you want to use this, you can also have um, you can have an, an explicit, like an only concatenation dependency on the depth variable. So you see it's, it's converging a little bit uh, faster, although it's taking longer to evaluate because these flows are more, a little bit more uh, crazier, more dynamic. What if you want to do something else, uh, SDEs for the finance guys, uh, you can specify your uh, drift and diffusion. You can have Stratonovich, Ito, uh, the noise type, um, bunch of solvers. Uh, it's the same API, so it's again link space, again a joint versus autograd. Um, so you can you could solve the same problem here with uh, with NearSD. Um, if you want to do stock price uh, forecasting with this, you might have to put it into an hybrid module where you're doing jumps, as we discussed with uh, neural graph differential equations. You will have a for loop as you step through your your time series. You will have a jump like an RNN cell, an LSTM cell to incorporate information into a latent space. And then you will flow. Um, you will have a, a continuous step um, integration between your timestamps, which can be an OD, an SD, uh, a CD, anything you, you, you want. Uh, with this, you, you can, for example, uh, extrapolate uh, if you're building a forecasting model in finance. Something else that we all, all, almost always get asked is uh, there's a lot of, uh, we have a lot of tutorials that you can step through. Uh, but a lot of them use this type of example where we are using uh, uh, NN sequential uh, modules to define our vector fields. And something that people ask us is, what if, what if I have prior knowledge of the vector field? It's, uh, some of the, the components of the equations I know, some others I want to, to learn or I want to do control. You can do it, uh, no problem. So you want to do control of uh, an acrobat, double pendulum. You have your dynamics equations. They're not very pretty, but you have them. You can uh, you can say, I know my control enters the the, the system uh, this way. Um, I want my controller to be parameterized by neural network, like this, right? Then you create your this is your your ODE system. This is your vector field that goes inside the neural ODE. Then you have access to the same API, right? So you're solving the system, the control system, in in batch and GPU. Um, and you, and you can solve an optimal control problem. You can say, I want to stabilize the system around this, this point. You have your, your cost function. That's maybe the norm of the state and the, the end point of, of, of the, the solution of the ODE. And then you can, uh, you can iterate uh, and optimize the, the parameters of the controller, right? So you can do model-based control, or you can go beyond, you can do model-free control. Say, so you know you're controlling a this type of system, you don't know the dynamics equations, but you know, for example, maybe it's a conservative system, you know, it's a mechanical system. You can you can put your knowledge here. You can have maybe an Hamiltonian neural network, a specific type of neural network that preserves energy. You can have a second order a type of dynamic. And that's all uh, model free in the sense that there's a neural network that, that's approximating everything. Uh, and this will give you better, this is what we, we mean by better sample efficiency for RL or, or control. Um, this is not, so in, in uh, we have a, a lot of um, tutorials, so um, feel free to check our, um, our GitHub. There, there's, a, there's a lot more indeed um, coming. Uh, we're in active de de development. We're working on a better solver suite. We're working with uh, PyTorch Lightning uh, closely. 
uh, to allow training at scale of neural differential equations. So if you want to have a huge batch of systems um, that you're simulating and you're simulating uh, stock price time series and you want to, to, to solve an optimal control problem there, you can do it at scale and uh, a lot more. But, but indeed, uh, feel free to reach out and, uh, and follow us and you'll see. I think that that's, that's all I have. Um, we're a bit late. Uh, I don't know. I'm happy to take all the questions that um, we have time for. Um, but otherwise, this is uh, this is the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you all for uh, for listening.